Hello and welcome to IT Unity's webinar, Planning for Mobile SharePoint Success, a deep dive into real business scenarios, sponsored by Polito. My name is Dan Holm, I'm the CEO and co-founder of IT Unity, and today we're going to be joined by two great experts in the space to look at what it takes for you to enable four very common business scenarios with mobility. Uh, before we dive into the topic, a quick introduction to each of us. So, Todd, why don't we start with you? Thanks, Dan. My name is Todd Maginski. I'm the Vice President of Mobility and SharePoint Solutions at Canvas Consulting. I've been working with SharePoint for over a decade, and in specific with SharePoint and mobile technologies for over four years now. Awesome. Welcome, Todd. And we're also joined by Ben Henderson, Product Manager from Polio. Hey, Ben. Hi there, Dan. Yep, I'm a product manager here at Caligo, um, and proud to be sponsoring this webinar today. Uh, my responsibilities here in a, are largely around the roadmap for the applications that we, Caligo, develop. Um, and I've been in SharePoint for, I would say, probably upwards of 10 years now, since, since the days of, uh, since, well, 2003 and before then. So, looking for good conversation. Wonderful. And my name again is Dan Holm. I'm an Office 365 MVP and I've been working with SharePoint for a decade now as well. Uh, and it's a wonderful opportunity to get us all together because each of us has worked with a number of customers who've been trying to implement mobility uh, and support remote and disconnected and, and uh, power users and information workers in the space. And the goal today is really to to bring that expertise together. So I'm honored and thrilled that you guys are able to join us. So let's talk a little bit about what going mobile really means. Today, mobility means not just the type of device you are using, but the way you are working. It's about workers who work remotely, who need access to content in distant, sometimes poorly or disconnected locations, and who collaborate with parties, not just within their organization, but outside their organization as well. And what we find when we look at the mobile experience in SharePoint is that the out-of-box SharePoint and Office 365 experience doesn't necessarily give everyone the richest and most friendly experience possible. If you've ever tried, for example, to get to a document library and open and edit and save a document in a browser on a device, you know, it can be a fairly excruciating experience. It's even tougher if you're trying to work offline because many of the mobile access points in SharePoint assume you're actually connected to your environment. Uh, and I'd like to read you a quote from a 2015 uh, study by AIM uh, called the AIM SharePoint Industry Watch Report. Uh, they reported that the lack of mobile support and the difficulties of getting external access have been frustrating. 35% of their uh, respondents feel that that experience has been frustrating. Another 20% are concerned that SharePoint, because of its frustrating user experience, is under threat from uh, other services, from especially non-sanctioned services. In other words, users are going around SharePoint and using other third-party tools, let's say things like Dropbox or Box, in order to get their work done simply because SharePoint isn't giving them uh, an experience that's easily adoptable. Um, as a point of reference, about 64% of respondents to the survey uh, are using VPN connections to connect to that data, and to um, and that becomes a, a, a problematic point because supporting those VPNs, especially on mobile devices, can sometimes be tricky as well. And finally, in all, because of these rough edges, these sharp edges, uh, an increasing number of people are turning to third-party tools to, to, to smooth out those edges and fill the gaps. Right now, about 11, almost 12% of respondents of the AIM study are using some kind of third-party tool to smooth the rough edges, uh, and 30, almost 33%, almost one in three, are looking at using a third party to support those mobility solutions. So uh, to give you an idea of the kinds of uh, places where third party tools come in to play a role, uh, these are the workflows that the AIM study looked at. And in this webinar, we're going to be looking, obviously, at the mobile workflow. You can see that smack dab in the middle. Um, and again, about 12% of companies are currently using third-party tools to smooth out those rough edges. Now, in the case of this webinar, what our goal is to do is to really help you understand those mobile scenarios and to understand what you can do out of the box, uh, where the sharp edges are, and how you can smooth out those, rough, those sharp edges. 
So we're going to attack that goal by exploring four real mobile business scenarios. We're going to look at information workers. Workers who need to be productive anywhere through secure access to enterprise content across devices and connections. We're going to look at field sales executives who need to drive sales through insights and interaction with customers. We're going to look at field technicians who need to be able to manage projects and ensure regulatory compliance through measurable interaction with corporate data. And we're going to look at professional services and consultants who need to offer a superior client service using collaboration and knowledge management. By looking at these four common business scenarios, we're going to be able to build, in the end, a collection of mobile requirements across all of those scenarios that together will help you build a requirements uh, set for any scenario that you're trying to support that requires mobility. So we hope that by the end of this uh, event, you've got a shortcut to evaluating and prioritizing your needs. Hopefully we'll you know, really cut the learning curve for you and help you identify those requirements that maybe you wouldn't have been able to identify as easily on your own. And we're going to give you a great tool that we're going to call the Mobile Success Matrix that will allow you to take those requirements across a variety of platforms and figure out whether you can support that requirement by configuring out of box SharePoint and Office 365, by building a custom solution, or by buying a third-party tool. So we'll give you a tool with which you can evaluate each requirement in any scenario you're supporting and determine how well you're going to be able to support that scenario. And as we go through this, most importantly, we're going to have a discussion and a debate and give you direction based on our experience with our customers on what we've seen uh, successful and what has taken a little bit more work. Last but not least, after we finish presenting, we are going to have a period of time for question and answers. So during the event, uh, if you're attending the live event, please submit your questions, and we will address those at the end of the session live with you. So let's dive into our first mobile business scenario, the information worker. The information worker today is mobile. And this is a change because years ago, mobility was really an investment reserved for senior executives and sales representatives. They were the first ones to get a mobile phone back in the days of brick phones. And they were the first ones that really warranted an investment in mobility. But today, information workers of all kinds have phones and tablets. They want to stay connected to the enterprise, its contents, and their peers. And work never no longer stops when they leave their desk. I would imagine if you're watching this event right now, you might actually not be at your desk as well. People expect to be able to access content from home. They want to be able to access content when they're traveling, when they're at lunch, or when they're at off-site meetings or conferences. So mobility needs to support work anywhere, anytime. And so let's start with this general scenario of the information worker and what we need at the most fundamental level to support their transformation from being desk workers to being mobile information workers. Now this scenario is certainly the most fundamental and basic scenario. The requirements for success in this, let's call it, information worker scenario are really the baseline requirements for all of the other scenarios we're going to discuss. So while these are the most, forward require, uh, the most straightforward requirements to lay out, uh, they're really the most important and they underlie all of the other more detailed scenarios that we're going to discuss later. So let's talk about the core requirements for this, uh, this use case. What are some of the common requirements for information workers? Um, and uh, let's bring in the, our, our panel of experts here to sort of start talking about what some of these requirements are. Ben, you've been working in the mobility space for quite a little bit of time. Why don't you start us off with laying out some of those requirements? Sure, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and I think you know, the first one that I guess would come in, into mind for me is, and it's it's right in this picture, um, this this gentleman here has probably got multiple devices. Um, this isn't just a single um, kind of one device uh, meets all. Um, this is a person that has multiple devices and expects the content to be um, on all of those devices. He's not expecting to have to manage all of those devices differently. He's expecting to have one single source of the truth that he can go up to his, as, as here, go up, go up to his um, colleague and say, 
you know, this this is the, the piece of content that I'm working on at my desk, but I'm able to walk over to you and share it with you in the office. I'm able to go to a meeting off-site and, and you take another device with me there where perhaps I can project and things like that. So that's the kind of first one I would say for me is a is is pretty strong on the on the kind of multiple devices front for a for a information worker. Um, some of some of the others um, to chip into really around that being secure. Um, that being, I guess, also uh, being able to have these this easy experience that uh, that people are familiar with, um, so that they aren't picking up a device that's, um, I guess, completely different to to what they're used to working on at their desk. They, the kind of your standard information worker, shouldn't have a, an issue with technology. I would I would say. I mean, we're all here to try and battle against that. Um, but these people really. Technology is, is battling against them to try and get their job to, to work, and, and making that single easy to use experience is also key. They're some of the ones off the top of my head. Awesome. And Todd, what would you add to that list? Well, I think Ben did a great job talking about, from a user's perspective, what their requirements are, but you also have the requirements from the point of view of the organization. And so, with regard to that, the Enterprise wants to roll out a platform that they can control and they make sure that they have the content and the data in it that their users need. But they also need to make sure that they roll out such uh, control with a application or a set of applications that really the users are going to buy into. Because at the end of the day, if the users aren't going to buy into the application you roll out, they're not going to use it, and then they're going to go attempt to use non-sanctioned systems like you talked about, Dan. And then also from that enterprise perspective, let's not forget security. No matter what type of device, how good the user interface is, and how well the organization can control the information in it, if it's not secure, that's really not going to be a good solution as well. Awesome. Well, that's a great summary. So let's roll all this together into some points that we can take away as sort of baseline requirements for the information worker scenario. We've got an enterprise requirement for a platform where they can manage critical information. And we need to have a way for users to access that information that's adoptable so that they don't go around and, and go to non-sanctioned systems. That platform and that access needs to be available anywhere on multiple devices, as Ben was suggesting. And needs to be a smooth user experience that's not jarring. So how users access on their desktop, transition smoothly to their tablet, to their phone, et cetera. Um, and then back to, and of course, we none of us mentioned this, but sort of assume you need to have, in many scenarios, access to that information offline. That's obviously a really core requirement as well. And last but not least, from the uh, back to the organization standpoint, we need to be able to draw security boundaries around that uh, information. We need to be able to govern it in the most broadest sense. Uh, and within the category of governance, security is certainly the most, uh, the most critical uh, piece of governance. So let's take a look at how we can take those requirements and support them with out-of-box SharePoint. Let's take a look at the capabilities that SharePoint and Office 365 offer straight away that we can simply configure and allow users to um, uh, attain some of these requirements. And we're going to look at three uh, broad categories of experiences, capabilities, and functions in SharePoint and Office 365. The first and most fundamental is OneDrive for Business. Now, as you probably know, OneDrive for Business is Microsoft's file sync and store and share solution uh, that is built into and on top of SharePoint. And OneDrive gives people a place to access, uh, access their documents. So let's take a quick look at what the OneDrive for Business experience uh, looks like both from a desktop scenario and a mobile device scenario. And I'll start by demonstrating the uh, online experience on, uh, on a web browser and with uh, Windows Explorer. So let me share my desktop. Okay, so I am working in Office 365, and as a user in Office 365, I have the ability to access my OneDrive from the app launcher in the upper left corner. There's other entry points as well. But when I go to my OneDrive, I am accessing my OneDrive for business. I uh, have to sign in here. I haven't used it for a little while, and that signed me out. 
And once I'm in here, I have a web-based experience with my files. So I've got the ability, obviously, to add files, create new files, uh, and if I select a file from here, I've got the ability to share it uh, and to get previews and so forth. So I've got a nice, rich experience with my files uh, in, a, in a web browser in Office 365. Um, now, this experience also translates onto mobile devices. And Ben, why don't you show us what the OneDrive experience is on a mobile device? Sure, I will. I just requested the control. I'm going to share my screen here now. Great. So this is um, this is my iPad here that I'm going to show and demonstrate the OneDrive app. And you can see here on the right-hand side, I'm going to open it up, and I can go straight into that same site that uh, that you were seeing through the web desktop. Um, similar type of experience here. All of my folders, my items are, are synchronized and kind of kept here. Um, and I can easily click on these, click on these items, and it gives me a, a preview of those items in a in the kind of native experience. Certainly not a, a true rich feature um, fulfilling application here, um, but allows me to do some simple kind of navigation here. I can um, open these up, and once I'm in them, I have some various controls on the bottom uh, that you can see. Oh, a little crash there, which uh, I'll just go back into and, and reload. Um, and down the bottom, again, we can see things like the recent files, um, the shared files that I have, so uh, any recent files that I've been working on, I can go in to see those. Um, and again, any, any documents that are shared with me through the OneDrive application, I can come in here and see those. Um, so, yeah, it's, uh, I would say certainly for um, nice previewing of items, I can come in here and, and do some kind of quickly see that these are the documents that perhaps I want to have a look at. Um, but it's kind of a... I would say somewhat slightly limited at that point um, in terms of the the experience and kind of what I am capable of doing with these items. And Ben, two questions about the mobile experience in OneDrive that I get regularly. One is, uh, is there any uh, way to ensure that files are offline on a on a mobile device on an iPad or an Android device? Um, from a OneDrive for Business perspective, you know, that's a good question, and I believe there's no easy way to see whether that or not they are. Um, you know, going into some of these items, you can come in and see properties to a point of some of these items that I'm seeing here now, um, and I can come in here and send them. So you're really kind of capturing that information out of this application. There's no the content here is, is very much limited to, to what you're getting through a nice, glossy web experience, I would say. Absolutely. And what and is there any way to ensure that if, for example, I'm uh, in this in straight in the OneDrive app, is there a way to ensure that if you've got access to the Jacksonville ad campaign that you're showing, that you can is this a way to secure that so you're not allowed to, for example, post that to Facebook or uh, or you know, take it out into an unsanctioned uh, 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 location? No, absolutely, and you kind of saw that there, where I get get the option to send the file, and I can just uh, just take this right out and and start uh, sharing it and doing whatever I want to do with it. Um, and ob obviously, the options to open in other apps too is uh, is kind of that uh, nice, easy way to get it out of my encrypted uh, encrypted data store that uh, that sits within the the kind of app platform of iOS, whereby it's it's secure when it's there, but once it goes out of there. Um, it's, it's kind of in, in anyone's hands, so uh, so no. Awesome. So we've got a pretty decent, you know, basic experience there, but we've seen some of the rough edges uh, in the in the out of box um, uh, OneDrive experience, which include the fact that uh, there's there's sort of a, a an inability to sort of take everything offline, which if that's a requirement, isn't going to be met by the native mobile experience, uh, and also the rough edge around security. Uh, that we can take uh, information out of the OneDrive experience into non-sanctioned services. Now, there's one thing you can do to limit that second scenario, and that is if you are on one of the higher subscriptions to Office 365, you can actually implement information rights management. So information rights management gives you the ability to add some additional levels of security that will help address that specific rough edge. Uh, but it requires um, a higher level subscription to Office 365.
Now, um, we looked at the experience in a browser, we looked at the experience on a mobile device. Uh, one of the requirements that we discussed was the importance of taking information offline. And it is easy, relatively, to take information offline on, uh, on a PC or a Mac. If we've got our OneDrive for Business, we can simply click Sync. And when we click Sync, OneDrive for Business will sync that entire container down on, onto our PC or Mac. Uh, so OneDrive for Business shows up, it synchronizes our devices, uh, synchronized to our device. And once we do that, we will have a node in Windows Explorer, or File Explorer as it's now called. Uh, and that node in my UI is showing up as OneDrive dash Contoso. That's my OneDrive for Business. And we can see here exactly the same files that I have in the browser experience. So I can take the entire container offline. Now that's a good thing, it works on a PC and a Mac. And later this year, later in 2015, Microsoft will be introducing additional capabilities to OneDrive for Business to improve the sync experience. Customers definitely have had uh, less than ideal experiences with synchronization in OneDrive for Business in its current iteration. Uh, but Microsoft is working uh, fast and furiously to smooth out the rough edges on the offline experience. Now, there's also a second way to access files uh, uh, for the information worker, and that is the team site scenario uh, access. So if, if we go back to my uh, team site here that I was on before, let me navigate back to that. Here is the team site for our legal group, and within this team site, we've got a contracts document library, and that contracts library also stores files. Let it load. And so we can see if, uh, a web part showing the documents library here on the home page of the site. I'll drop in and look at the document library in its full glory. And this is a team site in SharePoint, uh, but it looks very similar to OneDrive's web experience because it's built on the same set of code. And just like our uh, my personal OneDrive for business, I can use a similar set of experiences on my team site, including the ability to sync this uh, team site onto sync, sync this document library onto my system. Now I did this before we began the event today, and so I can show you the results of that. Um, once I've synced a document library, I get a separate node uh, in my Explorer folder tree. In this case, it's called SharePoint. And underneath there, I can see our contracts document library. So I've got the ability to take that team site document library offline. Unfortunately, one of the things I don't have the ability to do with um, Office 365 is I don't have the ability to take lists offline. I can take libraries offline, but I can't take lists offline. So that's a potential rough edge in that experience. Now, the team site document library is an experience that many of us are familiar with. We've, we've had it for a while, so I don't want to go into any more detail on that. But I do want to look at what Microsoft is doing as the next level of experience with, uh, for information workers, and that is the groups experience. Groups is a new construct that exists in Office 365, so this particular feature is an Office 365 only feature right now. And groups allow you to create groups. So I, for example, created a group for our legal and corporate affairs department. So this particular group is called legal and corporate affairs. And I can access this group from Outlook Web Access or from the people experience within Office 365. And once I've, once I've, once I've act, gotten into this group, I can access the group's conversations, its notebook, which is OneNote, and its files. And if I go to the group's files, we'll see, again, an experience that is being uh, driven on top of SharePoint's and OneDrive's for businesses experience. Same sort of, uh, of, of user interface, same ability to synchronize a library. And once again, when I synchronize this library, it shows up in my Explorer tree, and I can interact with the files from Explorer. So groups is simply a new metaphor for collaborating that is going to pull together capabilities across the Office 365 suite, including, in this case, OneDrive for Business. So with that, let's jump back to the slides here. Hey, Dan, I'd like to jump in with a couple comments about the different storage containers you just talked about there. Sure. Let me uh, stop presenting and jump back to the slides for us here. The, uh, a couple important things to point out is that 
when you're using OneDrive for business, you don't have any of those workflow capabilities that you get inside of a SharePoint document library in a SharePoint site. So if you need to facilitate approval on documents or make your own workflow that does things that are more complicated than that, you can't do that in out-of-the-box OneDrive. That's when you need to go to the SharePoint team site. Also, the Office 365 group, those files there, you can't have any workflows going on uh, with those as well. So those are important limitations to understand before you decide where you're going to put your documents if you do need to have workflow processes. And then another thing to point out just about the basic sync you showed with Windows Explorer, in my experience, I've noticed that if I have maybe a 35 meg uh, video file that I'd like to share with someone, if I put that video file into Windows Explorer and attempt to sync it, it seems to take much longer to sync than if I just go browse to the OneDrive site right in my web browser and upload that file immediately. So that's also something to keep in mind if you have large files and you need to sync them a lot. Sometimes manual process is a lot faster to go than just letting the sync do its own thing straight out of your desktop. That's a great point, and the synchronization uh, capabilities are quite different. When you're uploading and downloading with a web browser, you're using HTTP. When you're using sync, you're going to be using background intelligent transfer services or BITS. Uh, right now, you're using uh, a service built on top of Office uh, Office's sync engine, and that sync engine can be slower because it uses a, uh, it looks for available bandwidth rather than uh, just sort of pumping the file up or down. The advantage of using the sync uh, capability that's built into Explorer and Office, though, is it actually supports very large files as opposed to uploading and downloading with HTTP. So it's not necessarily easy for users to always know which way they should go. There's lots of variables to consider. Yeah, you have to find the balance there, don't you? You know, a couple other things to point out. Uh, if we, we, we saw OneDrive had some mobile experiences, right? We saw it on the, the desktop. We saw it in the iPad there. It also works on Android and Windows Phone as well. With the SharePoint team sites, you have a more limited mobile experience. It's driven by what they call the contemporary mobile view in SharePoint. And if you wish to customize that experience, that's really not supported, and it's also very hard to do, even if you try to do it in an unsupported fashion. So from the team site and the group perspective, your mobile experience is very limited and it's very hard to customize by just branding what's there out of the box. However, you can take it to the next level and just build your own experience on top of those storage containers. Awesome. That's a great point. And then what's been your experience with uh, uh, taking this, these, these rough edges that we've sort of revealed here? We've talked about uh, some challenges with offline access, with security, with customization and branding, and you can just make it feel like a company's own um, tool, what's been your experience with customers in that regard? Yeah, we've got a um, real kind of mix of customers um, out there. We've got customers that really want uh, security as their prime. You know, they 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 understand that. Um, the, the content is precious that they want, and they want to make sure that if it's on a device, it's in a sanctioned system. Um, that's kind of one element that we're having great conversations with some of the larger companies, perhaps some of the government, com uh, some of our government customers out there as well. Um, and and then we have people from the the kind of complete, I wouldn't say opposite, but they're really focused on the on the end user, and they're really focused on how do we get this a really nice experience. I mean, you know, going through there, you showed us probably what one, two, three, four or so different document libraries as such, um, where you're storing information to relevant places. So from an from an from, you know, we go back to our information worker whose job is not to be involved in technology at all, and 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 really that should be enabling him. Um, we're really discussing how do we make this a, a workable solution. And, and Todd said, you know, it's it's doing that kind of upfront. Do we need workflows? Do we need to be able to send items off to, to various other places like record centers and things like that? And can we do that from the right place? Um, so what we often get involved in, um, you know, is trying to get that as a, a succinct story for them as they go out to push out SharePoint or OneDrive or or, an, or, a, or a mobility solution um, into their end users. 
Awesome. And can you talk to us about, you know, the experience of one of your customers with, with the way you've approached helping them solve these problems? Yeah, so um, Quella on the on the next slide um, there is is really, I guess, not your mobile typical um, organization. Um, they are information workers. They're a, a talent organization, um, and they work largely on projects. Um, and their main requirements are, I would say, offline and ease of use. Um, that's kind of where their where their main kind of requirements going into this. They didn't have um, fancy iPads, iPhones, or, or Android devices. They didn't have a, a kind of need to do that. They just needed to be able to work um, kind of wherever they were from home. They didn't want to implement a VPN from what I can remember. Um, and so what I, I'll show you the, the kind of one of the elements of the solution that they uh, that they actually went with. Um, and this kind of goes back to the a similar demonstration that you showed with the OneDrive, but this is, I guess, how we um, we put it forward to our, our customer to be able to, to solve this the the problem that they were looking to do. And I'm just going to share my uh, my demo machine here, so that'll be coming up now. Second, okay. Um, so this is um, the the Windows machine that, uh, or an example of the Windows machine that they were running, and and they were largely project-based um, content. And you said, um, kind of going into the the file explorer mechanism now. Um, you know, you showed that how it was synchronized there down in the left hand, and you had two different nodes, fairly confusing, didn't quite know uh, where they were were exactly going off to. Um, the way that uh, our solution addresses that is one node. It's called the Cligo Engage product, and, and so everything sits under that node, and you can have underneath that everything. So I have one site, I think, added at the moment um, called Cligo, but you can have all of your record centers, all of your um, your group document libraries, you can have any single document library you can really find out there, um, all in one place um, and navigated, navigatable by, by File Explorer. Um, coming in here and seeing a nice easy user kind of experience based on what's not stored offline, based on what's is stored offline, because we also have the ability to cache this content. That makes this experience really, really quick. Um, so I can navigate through here, perhaps into a project folder, um, and further again into these to see that these these folders are both going up and down, which means that they're synchronized, I guess, in the, in the modern modern world. And I can come in here and perhaps look into in my communication uh, materials folder to see the content that I have here. Again, really nice and easy. Some of the advantages that we offer, obviously, are the ability that if I switch into a detailed view now, we've got a little bit more metadata coming through. So I can see that what's been assigned to this project. So this top has, has got some useful metadata associated to it the project ID, and where that project is, and that's in Vancouver, that's where I'm sat today. So really we do have um, lots more addition to that kind of general experience, and obviously then coming in and doing a right click on these brings me up a ton more experience. Um, so this really does leverage kind of the SharePoint capabilities within a file explorer window. You know, I can start checking out items, copying URLs, sending links, um, performing these items as if they're they're actually local. Um, so if even I go in and edit the properties, this isn't bringing up your file properties, this is bringing up the SharePoint metadata properties that are associated with this. So really nice and, and neat experience there to kind of not for my end users to have to be worried about this complex um, architecture that's been drawn out in, in SharePoint and where you know everything's all could potentially be all over the place. I'm working on a project, I have the project information stored, cached, and accessible. Some of the additional advantages of File Explorer are similar to, to OneDrive and the experience there as well is that you can go into Word and save directly to here. And if you were to do that with our product, you get a prompt for the metadata. So that mandatory metadata that you might have on those document libraries, you'll be prompted for that information before you can save the document there. Because I know one struggle for, I'm sure, lots of people out there is lots of checked out files, because <laughs> metadata is missing. So that's kind of a real glimpse at kind of how they're using the product on a, on a desktop, I guess, or a, or a laptop experience. But really, they wanted it mobile. Wow, Ben, that's, that's awesome. And while you've got your demo ready, I've got a, a point, which is it's always boggled my mind that 
as rich as SharePoint can be with information architecture and metadata, that there's never been an integration of that into Windows Explorer. Uh, you know, I assumed that, that would come out back in the days of Windows Vista, when SharePoint was already the big billion dollar business from Microsoft. I was like, oh, well, Windows Vista will certainly expose that metadata in Explorer, and that didn't happen. And Windows 7, and then Windows 8, and I was really sure Windows 10 would do it. Um, and I think it's so cool that you've got the ability to interact with metadata directly in Explorer and directly in the Office applications. That's, that's actually huge for organizations that care about metadata. Absolutely. Uh, and a question I, that I actually had not thought of before. In your, in your uh, tool set, you're showing on icons of both upload and download. Do you have the ability to actually control which direction synchronization is happening with uh, Clio and Hinge? Yeah, so I mean, for those people that perhaps don't want um, the content synchronized offline um, because they're using large, maybe they they do have those large kind of um, you know PowerPoint presentations and things like that. We would suggest that they don't store that content offline, and but they may want to save to that location when they're offline. So. What we have the ability to do is, you know, something like this, where you see uh, the content in in um, in my comms materials. You would actually just see the structure, and you wouldn't see any content in there. So it, what that allows you to do is it allows you to save to that location, and it allows you the prompt for metadata to come up, so you can still navigate there. But we're just not storing the actual physical file there. That's actually super cool because I'm running into problems with customers where they're working on devices that have small storage. And they want people to be able to, you know, use OneDrive for business, but then when you're, you know, in order to see the structure, you have to synchronize the entire document library. And so you end up with a situation where you just simply can't give users easy access through Explorer to everything they might need to access. Exactly. Exactly that. Very, very cool. Our second business scenario that requires mobility is the field sales executive. Sales executives drive corporate revenues. The sales department is usually one of the first to be equipped for mobile success. And it's important that there's a systemic approach to helping sales representatives prepare for those in-person interactions. Make sure that they've got access to the information about their customers so they can effectively engage with those customers. And that they've got the information about the products and services they're selling so they can present to those customers. The scenario is straightforward enough here. Um, you get the idea. They're equipped with tablets, laptops, smartphones. They need to be able to sell anything everywhere to those customers to drive corporate revenues. Uh, so, Todd, what, what have you seen in sort of the standard requirement set for the field sales executive that goes beyond just the typical information worker? Yeah, let's, let's jump into that for a bit. So what does the field sales executive need to do their job? Well, first, they need to have their contacts list, right? If you don't know who your customers are and how to call them up and contact them, you're going to have a hard time doing your job. The second piece is business intelligence about your customer. And shortly, I'll demonstrate a solution we built here before. But if you don't arm your uh, field executive with the information they need to have an intelligent sales conversation, uh, then they're not going to be as successful. The next thing is if you go on a sales call, you've got to have your sales collateral with you, don't you? You've got to be able to show brochures and sales presentations and other things like that at a moment's notice to your client, depending on which direction the sales call goes and what type of collateral you need to use to convince them that they should buy your product. The next thing is really understanding data behind the scenes on what kind of inventory do you have available. Are you going to be able to give that to your customer right away? And how much is it going to cost them to buy it? And without that kind of information, again, you can't really have an effective sales call. Finally, uh, it depends on the type of sales call in the industry you're in, but many salespeople f submit orders right there during their sales call as well. Uh, usually not the case right in the kind of work we do where there's a longer sales cycle and you have a more involved SOW and things like that. But if you're selling a product and you go on a sales call and convince your client they'd like to buy some of it, well, then it would be great if you could fill out an order right then and there for them and have some type of form technology to allow you to actually complete that sale. And also offline access. You cannot be guaranteed that when you go on a sales call, you're going to be able to get to the internet. 
Uh, a very good example of that is uh, customers that have are in giant office buildings. Sometimes offices are in the basement of an office building and try getting a cell signal down in an office like that. Uh, it's not always going to work out for you. So that brings us to how does SharePoint and Office 365 fulfill all those different pieces of the puzzle? So this is something we can talk about and chat about together here a little bit. And Office 365, there's a lot of different ways to get contacts, aren't there? You've got contacts that you can store in SharePoint. It's not really the most ideal scenario, just the functionality that they have in SharePoint and contacts is more rudimentary. Uh, contacts in Outlook, though, that's great, isn't it? If you have your contacts list right there on your Exchange server, you're pulling them up in Outlook, you can export them, you can search by them, you can click right on them and send them emails or initiate a call uh, via uh, Skype, for instance. Then we also have uh, the contacts in Outlook that belong in the new group scenario. And here, um, We'll get into those group members a little bit more in the next scenario and dive deeper into that bit. And then the experience there. Dan, what are the different experiences we have to access all those different contacts? Well, I think that's one of the rough edges with dealing with contacts with the out-of-box tools is depending on where you're storing the contacts, you've got different ways to access them. If your contacts are in SharePoint, you can access them in the web browser or in um, Outlook, if you connect that SharePoint contacts list to Outlook. If you've got your contacts in Outlook, they can either be in your personal Outlook store or in a public folder. Um, and obviously the public folder makes it easier to share contacts. So generally in a sales scenario, it's, 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 you could have one or the other. You could have your personal contacts or you could have shared contacts that, that are being tapped into by different salespeople. And in those scenarios, you're either going to be using Outlook to access those contacts or using Outlook Web Access, that's assuming that you are connected. If you need the offline experience, you're pretty much going to be stuck with Outlook. There's no other way to do Outlook the out-of-box tools to take a contacts list offline. Um, and so the good news is Outlook is a very rich experience. The bad news is configuring shared contact pools in public folders and getting them pushed to your users is not always the easiest thing to do for an organization at least in my experience. Very good. So the next piece of the puzzles I mentioned was business intelligence. And the easiest way to go about business intelligence with SharePoint and Office 365 is to really use Excel web apps. Because inside of Excel, you can use charts and graphs to build various dashboards and things. And one of the really nice things about using Excel web access for business intelligence is that the only skill set you really need is the ability to connect to a data source from Excel and then use your Excel, Excel uh, chops to build charts and graphs that connect to the data you've got in your Excel document. So you don't need to write a lot of custom code to implement such a BI solution there. Yeah, and awesome. I, I don't have much to add to that, Todd. I think uh, the lightweight BI experience in, in, uh, in SharePoint is nice with the pieces you can put together, but the offline experience is just simply not there. Yep. And then we talked about the content, storing that sales collateral. Well, we've already covered that part in the previous scenario, so there's not really much more to go into it besides you could use OneDrive for Business or the team sites for SharePoint, or you could use the groups and the shared documents folders that they have for the groups as well. Yeah, but the real experience, I, the real story there, I think, for this particular scenario is that now it's not just about storing the files, it's about presenting them. And there's some great ways to take things from SharePoint, Office 365, Team Sites, Groups, OneDrive, whatever you want to call it, and present it. If you are connected, you've got the ability to use uh, the Office web applications. And this would be a great scenario if, for example, you're presenting remotely and you want to share a presentation with someone uh, and work on it when the two, the, the, both the customer and the salespeople are in different locations. Mm -hmm. But if you're face-to-face -face and you need real offline access, uh, that story is actually pretty decent now. Well, since about a year ago, Microsoft started releasing the Office applications for uh, mobile devices. 
So with the mobile versions of PowerPoint, for example, Word and Excel, it's now pretty straightforward to take a document that you've got stored in OneDrive for Business and present it. So that's actually a pretty good story now, I think. I agree with you there. I actually have Office installed on my phone, which is Android. I use an iPad as well, and I use a PC and a Mac computer. So I'm using every single flavor that they have, and they all work very well for me. Next what about the uh, yeah? What about the inventory piece, Todd? Yeah. So it depends, I think, on the size of your business if you're really going to have your inventory in SharePoint or not, right? Uh, if you think of a giant company with tons of different products, they're probably going to have a different system than SharePoint to track their inventory. But for a small business, there are many small businesses which actually build CRM systems and inventory uh, management and right there inside of SharePoint, and they handle their orders based on SharePoint data stores. So as we look at SharePoint lists, as we mentioned before, you don't have any offline access to them. And so that could be a real deal breaker in a mobile scenario right off the bat. But one nice thing you do get out of the SharePoint list is you get the ability to edit that list and you get the forms to put in new items and edit those items and update them and put workflow around them. So that is one nice aspect of what you can do with SharePoint list. But as we mentioned, the mobile interfaces with SharePoint lists, that is limited to the contemporary mobile view that SharePoint gives you out of the box. And if you need to brand that up further than just changing the color on it, or you need to try to make that user interface change so it more fits in with the line of business application and your flow of how you do things, then uh, a SharePoint list is not really going to meet your needs in a mobile perspective. And that also talks about the, the forms. So we just talked about that bit there. And so, Ben, what, what are you seeing when it comes to the field sales executives and how you've helped people like that enable scenarios to allow them to do their job? Sure, Todd. So I think the, the example that I wanted to bring up here is the company called uh, Banco Dental. Um, they are kind of, they, they are effectively a sales team that we, we were working with there, um, they they go around to these uh, dental offices uh, maybe a dozen a day with maybe prior to a, to using SharePoint in our product, somewhere in the, in the region of around 2,000 different manufacturing documents, so kind of brochures, brochureware, um, they would go to, go into these kind of offices with big kind of clunky um, briefcases I guess of, of this information and try and get to the trying to find that item was was an absolute nightmare um, if they were looking for something specific um, so what I'm going to do is quickly just take over kind of the presenter again here um, and share my my desktop and um, what I'm actually going to bring up now is our iPad application which is what they switched to so they switched to um, Caligo Engage um, for the iPad because basically it looks pretty sexy and that's kind of the feedback that we got. Um, they wanted to get their sales guys and give them, equip them with the best tools um, that allows them to make a, a quick sale because that's what they're in there selling, you know, selling things quickly, lots of orders, lots of different products, small products, um, and they're flying around um, the, the, the US effectively selling these products. So what we have here is the Caligo Engage application that is secure. It's controlled by the corporate IT with a, with a policy for, in this case, a password to access. Um, within here, we have a very familiar user interface where the content has been pushed down to them based on the, the customer that they are, also based on the salesperson that they are. So in this case, um, you know, I'm, I'm a specific salesperson that has a number of assets. I'm, I'm perhaps also working on, on various other things um, within here. Um, but this can be pushed from any location that sits on SharePoint based on, on effectively who I am. Um, so, so they can come in here. They can easily go into perhaps a, um, an asset folder or something like this, see a, a document that they've been working on, um, and get a quick preview of that. Um, 
you know, if this is a an example document, you know, they, they have some really nice, easy features to, to use here. Um, they can then do things that their corporate policy allows them to do. Um, so in my case, I'm, I've decided to allow everything so that you can at least see what, what I can do with these documents. So I can go in and see the details of this document. Um, I can see all of that metadata that I may well have added um, to this document. Um, and I can go and do things like checking out a document. I can take a document elsewhere. So I've got some options here. And this is where it starts getting trimmed based on who you are. Um, I can... I can, as an administrator, say, well, I don't want this person to be able to open it to any documents, share it to anybody, email it, print it, or open it in SharePoint. I want to completely restrict this because this, this document cannot go into any other systems on my iPad device. Then I can do that, and that just is represented in a UI change here for the end user. So really nice, easy to use. Um, as you saw here, this was a signature I'd captured, and we have the ability to do all of those types of things. So you know, you were talking very quickly around getting the uh, the user to um, to kind of sign an order or something like that. Then absolutely, I can come in here, take a sketch, grab a picture, um, and do various things like that. Um, I've even got it so wide open in my in in my scenario that I can bring in different um, different items from other services, so Box and OneDrive, I can actually add items from there right from within this application. Um, again, in this case of Benko, it was really quite restricted. They didn't have any of this. Um, it was purely almost a, a document distribution kind of tool. But uh, once it was, I was in here, as I don't think we're going to come back to this demo, to, to just give you a quick overview of, of some of the, the features as well that we have on the, on the device. That's great. Thanks for demonstrating that bit there. It looks very handy to me. Yeah, it looks awesome to me as well. And I think, uh, Ben, there's a couple of things that we saw there that I'd like to uh, relate back to our discussion about the broader information worker scenarios. Uh, because one of the things I find as a consultant is it's helpful to look at third-party tools not only to see if they solve your problem, but because it helps show you what the product can't do on its own. It helps show you where those gaps are. And so you mentioned, for example, um, the uh, user experience. What we just saw there was a very rich, good-looking, sexy, you called it, user experience that's quite different than some of the user experiences that are part of the mobile, uh, the modern mobile view of SharePoint. Secondly, you mentioned um, the fact that the organization can actually push content to the user. Uh, with the out-of-box experiences, it's kind of up to the user to make all the connections. Uh, but you just mentioned that your customers have the ability to actually push content to users, which is uh, again, a gap in the out-of-box tool set. The third was we saw lists there, and that's a really big one that Todd mentioned as well. When you're in a sales uh, a scenario and in many other mobile scenarios, you need access to lists, to calendars, to uh, you name it. Um, and we saw that uh, there in um, Toledo Engage. And the fourth thing was security, and that idea of being able to build fences around the content to ensure that people don't do things with the content that go outside of corporate policy. So, not only did, did uh, you show off some great things related specifically to the business scenario as a whole, the field sales executive scenario as a whole, but also to what we talked about with information workers. Uh, but Todd, where are the things that even a third-party tool uh, isn't necessarily going to uh, meet all the needs? What are the things that sort of push customers over into needing to build custom solutions? Yeah, so when you need to make a, a custom solution, I, I think one of the first things is is Custom branding will drive a lot of customers to a, a custom solution. The other one is really building a user interface custom tailored to an exact business process or what someone needs to do to do their job effectively. So here's an example of a custom mobile sales application that integrates with SharePoint as well as many different other data sources uh, for a customer that we created. And so in this scenario, what we have is the ability for sales representatives at a company to pull up the application right there on their iOS device and see pins that are dropped around their current location that indicate where are my customers, where are my customer accounts, and where are my competitors located 
close to me. So you can imagine the mobile sales rep is out in the field. They are looking at which customers are close to them, and they can get a really good feel on not only how to get there, but who's nearby in case they have some extra time while they're in that town that day uh, before they jump on their flight to go home and maybe do another sales call. So clicking on one of the pins in the map gives you more information about that particular company, and then you can drill down more into the accounts and learn about where those different accounts are located. And then finally, getting detailed business intelligence information that really allows you to facilitate an intelligent sales call. In this case, you see in the fourth screenshot, we have a metric called units down. And we have that uh, yearly data going back. In this case, our data set only goes through 2012. But what a salesperson can do with this particular application is they can look at this units down metric. And this units down metric means you have purchased a product of ours and you use it in your manufacturing process. And a unit down means that particular product you purchased from us is now out of commission. And when someone reports a unit down, it basically means their manufacturing has stopped and that's costing them money. And so with this metric, a salesperson can very quickly understand if there are many units down for this particular customer, how they compare to the average for all the customers that the client has, and walk into that sales uh, conversation and say, hey, I see you have units down. I know that's costing you money. I suggest you order some backup items and have them on the shelf so that as soon as something breaks, you can swap this in for it and you don't lose as much money uh, lost uh, from the lack of manufacturing while your assembly line is down. And they can also save them money by saying, you don't have to rush ship these replacement parts, and you can spend money on standard shipping. And for the products that this particular company ships, the shipping costs can be in the hundreds or thousands of dollars because these products are actually gas compressors, and they can weigh up to a ton or more. So that's a really good example of building a mobile sales application that's really customized and slipping BI into it to make your sales executives much more productive. And so to boil this back to the requirements that we discussed, I assume then that the thing that's pushing customers in this kind of scenario towards this kind of solution, I see geo uh, geolocation capabilities and the ability to integrate with the, the native features of the device for geolocation. And also, it looks like you've got very rich relation of data. So it's not just access to one list. It's the relationships that this application creates between customers, uh, the, the purchase history, uh, averages across the industry, and that sort of thing, huh? That's exactly right. And one interesting thing about this as well is you're not just having relational data and SharePoint lists here. This actually pulls from five different data sources behind the hood and they are all consolidated with SQL Server integration services into a data warehouse custom built for this mobile application. So when you do have data coming from many different places in the organization, including SharePoint or Office 365, this is a really compelling reason to go custom with what you're building. So let's take a look at another mobile scenario by looking at the daily needs of field engineers and technicians. Now, while many industries come to mind, like consulting and engineering firms and building and construction, the oil and gas industry is a particularly interesting one. So let's, let's use that as a scenario. Today's drilling engineer is responsible for overseeing drilling operations from initial well design to testing, completion, and abandonment of wells. He's responsible for monitoring drilling progress, for maintaining worker safety, and very importantly, for ensuring compliance with dynamic operating environmental and regulatory requirements. So this idea of compliance is a key one. Let's look at what it's like to effectively, managing, to, to effectively manage these tasks and these requirements while on a remote land site, mobile unit, or one of the most extreme environments, an offshore drilling rig with limited access to the kinds of amenities that we take for granted in an office like Wi-Fi and instant access to enterprise information. That stuff's tough on an oil rig. Drilling engineers require access to the most current versions of data, safety standards, and operating procedures. Uh, and because of an aging oil and gas workforce, this is especially relevant for mitigating safety and liability risks that have arisen with the arrival of less experienced workers. 
So in addition to uh, all of this, drilling engineers need to be able to upload site photos, revise project schedules, and report operating results from the field. So how can this kind of uh, complex scenario be supported when there's no uh, uh, connectivity or inconsistent connectivity because of the remote location of the, uh, of the, of the drilling rig? So the requirements for this scenario in sum are first, they're going to need to have, to have access to contacts, very much like salespeople, but in this case, it's not customers, it's really, uh, in addition, the team members and the vendors. They're also going to need to have access to data, particularly data to help manage schedules and projects. As far as content goes, like all of our mobile scenarios, they're going to need access to content, but in this case, it's particularly critical content because it deals with safety. There's you know, human safety and human lives at stake here and procedures. There's form submission, which in this case centers around ensuring compliance and reporting to regulatory agencies. And there's a potential requirement for rich media integration, where they may need to be able to view and upload rich media, photos, videos, for example. And all of this needs to be offline. And once again, very important and unique to this scenario, highly auditable and reportable so we can ensure compliance. So how do we achieve these kinds of things with out-of-box SharePoint and Office 365? We talked about several ways to manage contacts in one of our earlier scenarios, but in this case, when we're talking about trying to keep track of teams, there's the new possibility of using groups. And Todd, why don't you tell us about that? Yeah, so when you're using groups in Office 365, this works very similar to how it does when you add members to a SharePoint site. You add members to groups in Office 365. And Office 365 gives you a page where you can actually look at all the members that are part of that group, and then you can click on that particular contact and learn information about them and get their email address, initiate conversations with them, things like that. Awesome. And as far as data access goes, if we're talking in this scenario about schedules, uh, what are some options for managing schedules in SharePoint and Office 365? So you've got a few different ways to go about it. You can create a calendar inside of SharePoint. You can use your personal exchange calendar. You can use the shared calendar inside of one of the Office 365 groups. And then you can get mobile access to all these based on the different ways we talked about accessing those different technologies for mobile devices as well. Uh, one of the things to keep in mind is offline access to your contacts, though. You can do that if you've synced it from a SharePoint list uh, into one of the tools that Ben showed us. Uh, in Exchange, you obviously have your contacts offline. We see how they sync into our phones and our tablets and our, our uh, PCs as well. Uh, there's really no offline story right now for contacts when it comes to groups, though. So I expect that's going to be something we're going to see coming from Microsoft in the future. Exactly. And I think, you know, between contacts and schedules, my hope would be, as Microsoft delivers, that those capabilities within groups, that groups really might be the best place to support those particular requirements of this scenario. And what about content? Well, content obviously can be stored in OneDrive for Business, and we've already talked about that with other scenarios. Uh, but when it comes time to filling in forms, in this case, you're not just submitting data, but you're needing to make sure that that data is uh, meeting all of the compliance requirements of your industry. And on many, in many key situations, that means that that form needs to become a record. Then the fact that you're having to lock down that form so it can't be edited, and perhaps apply document retention policies to it, almost eliminates using the personal OneDrive for business, and even uh, at this point, the group documents library, because that doesn't have content types and retention applied to it yet. What's left as far as supporting records management needs in uh, this scenario, Tom? Well, what you've got left then is you've really got SharePoint sites. So you could do those in an on-premise SharePoint environment, or you could also do that in an Office 365 SharePoint site. And so you get a, the capabilities of the platform SharePoint gives you with records management there. And this is actually something that I recently wrote an article on for the Office 365 Patterns and Practices, where we talk about records management and how you can approach that from an Office 365 point of view. One thing to point out is, 
the way that a developer interacts with SharePoint to configure it and to create records uh, management policies and put governance around that is different than how it was in SharePoint before. Because in an on-premise uh, full trust code SharePoint scenario, you've got timer jobs running on the SharePoint server that are going to go through your records, evaluate data such as documents and say, every time I find a document of this content type, I need to make sure that this information management policy is applied to it. Now, as we move to the new add-in model with SharePoint, you're going to have to write those timer jobs on a remote system, perhaps in something like an Azure web job or a console application you run as a scheduled task, but the actual code that executes and the logic for it to ensure you've got good governance around your records management is no longer running on the SharePoint server. Wow, interesting. And I know the rich media experience is another place that's going through a lot of changes right now. Organizations are increasingly relying on video, photos, and, uh, and audio uh, types of content, not just traditional documents. And SharePoint Office 365 has some great media capabilities. For example, you can certainly store media in a normal document library, but then the interaction with it isn't particularly rich. However, SharePoint 2010 introduced picture libraries, and SharePoint has asset libraries. Both of those have interactions with the media content that are richer. So if you store a photo in a in a pictures library or an asset library, for example, it shows up as a thumbnail, and you've got previews of media in those libraries. Microsoft also just introduced uh, in the last year the Office 365 videos uh, experience, which is a corporate video portal that allows you to upload videos from even now mobile devices and then have access to those videos. So SharePoint Office 365 have nice, new, rich media capabilities. Unfortunately, none of them are available offline. The only experience that's available offline is the traditional document library, the one drive for business, and those can be synchronized with out-of-box tools, but when you interact with those libraries in the web browser, there's no media interaction. There's not even a thumbnail view available that got removed. So my, my, uh, my experience has been the uh, combination of rich media and offline requirements end up leading to a pretty poor set of out-of-box options. Todd, have you seen any other out-of-box solution to this? For the out-of-the-box solution, I really don't know of anything else out there right now, but what you can do is you can integrate with the picture libraries and the asset libraries, and you can build your own user interfaces on top of those. You can easily brand them, and the asset library is actually a lot of fun. I mean, just even from an end-user point of view, right? I mean, it handles the audio, the video, like you said, the very good thumbnails. It's got good streaming capabilities as well. So that's a really good solution. And then for Office 365 videos, you can also programmatically access the Office 365 video portal to do things like creating new channels or uploading videos to the video portal. And I'll show an example of that here in a little bit. So that really sounds like if you want both the uh, rich interaction with media and the offline access, you're really going to be looking at a, a, a something that's not just out of box. Um, so those two requirements have some challenges going together. Uh, and last but not least, very important to this scenario, insight and reporting. How do we know that safety procedures were read? Uh, how do we know that they were followed? How do we keep track of forms that were filled in from an auditing perspective? And SharePoint out of the box on-prem, uh, and even in Office 365, has some auditing. But my experience is that it, uh, SharePoint's out of box auditing rarely aligns with real business requirements. Um, configuring the auditing is challenging. Uh, maintaining the audit logs beyond a short period of time is challenging. And then making sense of the information is the biggest challenge, having it align with what you're really trying to understand about your business. Todd, have you seen anyone you know, sort of achieve real success with the out of box uh, auditing capabilities of SharePoint? Only in very simplistic scenarios and in very small businesses. But if you add in the factor of a lot of data and try to put governance around that auditing, that's a lot of code and a lot of process that you have to put in place. Awesome. So I think with this scenario, we've definitely hit some sharp edges in SharePoint and Office 365 that simply just can't be met out of the box. Uh, ben, how are some of your customers addressing these scenarios then? 
Sure, and, uh, and North Power here is the one that's, that comes straight into into mind. They're um, based out of New Zealand. They're um, they are a, a power provider and, and have lots of uh, remote engineers working. Um, and they used to give them these manuals, as you said, and, and they would, the manuals would be huge. They'd become out of date. A lot of printing, um, and they'd have to carry these manuals up to the top of you know, scaffolding, they'd have to go up to the top of these power lines, um, hanging often, um, and then they suddenly need to find out exactly how they should be working with a particular part. So they'd have to come back down, pick up, sift through the manuals, which one, and they have to read these. Um, go through it, make sure that they have any of the updates, and then go back up and, and perform a piece of work. Um, North Power uh, decided to deploy the Engage iOS app, um, and a number of a number of reasons really. Safety wasn't a huge concern of theirs. Uh, what was a, a, the main concern was getting the right people, the right content, and then making sure that they read it. Um, that's the kind of key one for them. Um, so we talked about compliance around the, those types of things. Um, they had to, the, or the, the risk that they were trying to mitigate was that someone would injure themselves at the top of a of a pylon and they'd blame it on the organization effectively, I guess. Um, and so they needed a way that, that as an employer, I could prove that that person had the latest content and, it, and then they chose to go against that content. So using the Caligo Engage console, uh, that's a Microsoft Azure-based application, we store all of the insights and analytics of what's going on, on within our applications for the end users so that they can track this. They can see exactly who's got what content on what device, what they're doing with that content. And then, you know, hopefully not, but if the, if the day comes whereby they do need to refer to those uh, logs to see whether someone did read the right safety material, then, you know, that, that is then something that they can do. And it, as, a, as a risk mitigation, it's huge for them. Um, that plus a nice, easy, Thin device that they have going up in, up to these kind of these these pylons and the scaffolding is is an absolute no brainer for them and they're they're continually to succeed in 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 allowing their field engineers to work uh, way better out in the field. Well, that's interesting, uh, and then you know my experience as a consultant is that sometimes when you're talking about scenarios like these mobile scenarios, you as a as a as a as a business you're trying to justify getting a third-party tool as far as how it's going to make the experience better for the user, the sort of traditional return on investment scenario. Yeah. And sometimes the, 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 the business decision makers don't respond well to that. And as a consultant, I found in many situations, you can actually get decisions made faster. Instead of talking about what goes better when the tool's in place, look at what goes worse if the tool isn't in place. And I think you hit just a really interesting example of that, where if you really look at the risk of not doing it well, the risk of one single lawsuit could actually drive a decision to get a tool that in all reality makes every day better for the users. Absolutely. Um, yeah, it was it was exactly that. Cool. Now, Todd, you, you know, as we were looking at the requirements, we saw some places where uh, out-of-box uh, and maybe even in some situations third-party tools don't meet the need, and you really do have to turn to development. I know you spend a lot of time at Canvas doing amazing projects for companies who are uh, looking for custom mobile solutions. Why don't you show uh, you know, what some of the things are that you can build on top of um, SharePoint Office 365? Yeah, that sounds great. Uh, one of the things that you'll find as you build uh, a line of business application that is extremely dialed into how a company does its business is that you've got people in the field and you've got people at their desks in the home office facilitating a single process. And to take advantage of all the pieces of Office 365, because many of them are brand new right now, the experience as you bounce between SharePoint sites, as you go between the video portal, as you go between Office 365 unified groups, and you take advantage of all those technologies, it's a little bit of a fragmented experience right now, and, and users can get a little lost on, hey, the UI just looked like this when I was in the SharePoint site, and now I've jumped over to this group, and I, I've got this similar functionality, but my user interface is different. And so sometimes you need to build an application where you take all these pieces of the Office 365 platform and put them into a single application, 
and supplement it with mobile applications so that the user interface is very seamless and the entire experience is very easy for everyone to do their job. So a very good example of this is the property management Office 365 web application as well as the mobile applications that supplement this web app. And I'm going to show you a short tour of this right now. If you'd like to see the end-to-end -end scenario of this entire demo, we do have a link to it in one of the slides later in the deck. But this is something that we built for Microsoft, that Microsoft is using at conferences to demonstrate the power of Office 365. And also, equally important, We've released all the source code to this so developers can actually learn the right way, the right patterns, and get examples of how to call these APIs and integrate all these technologies into one unified system. So I'm going to take over here and share my screen. There we go. So the first place I'm going to start is just a quick tour of the dashboard here. Uh, in this case, uh, the company is called Contoso Property Management. And this company is responsible for managing several different properties that are owned by many different people. And they go out and they inspect those properties. And if they find problems with those properties, then they dispatch a repair person to repair it. And so in such a scenario, you need to understand as you can see in the dashboard here, you got a quick glance at inspections that are upcoming, inspections you've conducted in the past, and you can see that they were completed and who did them and what the inspector was. You can see in properties that have inspections that reveal there's repair that need to be made. And then you can also see inspections that have repairs completed and see which ones have been approved and not approved. So this web application here, as you'll notice in the URL at the top, this is actually running in Microsoft Azure. And so this is interacting with SharePoint Sites, Office 365, Unified Groups, the video portal as well. And we're using Workflow and Azure behind the scenes. Uh, clicking on one of these inspections will take you to the details about it. And here, the real power of Office 365 comes into play. Uh, I'm not going to step through the scenario because our web seminar today is going pretty long, but I am going to give you a quick tour of the pieces of the puzzle. So in the top left, we have details about the property itself and who inspected it. All this information up here is stored in a SharePoint site in a SharePoint list. We have the members who are members of the unified group associated with this property. So in this scenario, Contosa Property Management is creating one unified group for each property they manage. And here are the members of that group. And I'm pulling out their pictures as well. I've also got the conversations that are happening inside of that unified group that I can view. And if I click the See More link, for instance, here you can see I open up the web page that takes me straight to that unified group and it allows me to see all the conversations that are happening about this group. I've also got the recent documents as well as the property files. These are the same document store, but these are the files we talked about before in the unified group. Again, if I click that, then I can go over and I can view those documents right inside of the unified group. We've also got the ability to actually open up a document right from here in Office Web Apps, as we talked about before. So here I'm opening a PowerPoint document very easily and taking advantage of Office Web Apps to allow me to view it and edit it. We've also got the ability to dig into the email or to even upload a file straight from this user interface into that collection of documents associated with the unified group. We've also got more information that really allows us to facilitate the process uh, as it goes from end to end. And we can see the photo that an inspector took on their mobile device, as well as which information they reported about it. And then we can see what the dispatcher said they need to do to fix that issue. 
And we can also see what the repair person went on site and took a picture and the comments they made here. Now, I mentioned that this type of experience uh, is two pieces. Uh, here we have the part that is inside of the web application, but we also have the mobile apps. And so here I am on my iPad simulator, and I can open up an inspection application that the inspector uses on site, and I can log into the inspection app. And when I log into the inspection app, I'm just going to open that again real quick. There we go. Here the inspector can actually use this application to come into the tool and take pictures and submit them into the SharePoint system. For example, maybe I found an incident in the bathroom here, so I can take a photo, I can upload that photo to SharePoint, put in comments about it, say what type of incident it was, and now I can submit that to SharePoint. So now we have a complete scenario where we've really used the Office 365 platform to allow us to have this unified experience both in the field as well as in the office. And you can probably hear the chimes going off. I already have an email here that indicates that that inspection has been conducted and that uh, the incident was found. So this is a really good example of going beyond out of the box and uh, building a really tailored solution built on the Office 365 platform that works with mobile technologies. Awesome, Todd. That's a really, really cool application. And I must say, that is the most beautiful bathroom I've ever seen on any property on the planet. <laughs> <laughs> so to sort of uh, put a button on this, you know, the, 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 I, it seems to me that what you've achieved here, uh, in addition to what we've talked about in other mobile scenarios, is you've created a single application that pulls together all kinds of experiences from across SharePoint and Office 365, enhances it with things that don't even exist well in those platforms in the first place, like very easy media upload. And you're giving people a single experience to a wrapper around all those services in Office 365. You know, it reminds me of the early days of SharePoint, where people would say, why would you build this in SharePoint? I could build a web app and do the same thing. Well, the reason you do that and you take advantage of all these technologies is because you don't have to create them. They're all there for you. All you have to do is wire them together, put a user interface on it, attach some workflows to facilitate the whole thing, and you've really got a world-class app that allows your employees to do their job no matter what industry you're in. Fantastic. Our fourth scenario to discuss today is professional services scenario. Professional services forms, things like accounting firms, legal firms, management consulting firms, they face some unique collaboration challenges. Uh, managing a huge volume of project-specific documents, email, attachments across globally dispersed workforce and client base can often lead to inaccurate or unavailable information as well. Workers at client offices must be able to access and manage the latest data or risk productivity losses, poor client services, with potentially huge costs to the organization. Managing and sharing documents and emails effectively is critical for collaboration and engagement management, and increasingly important for risk and compliance. Professional services firms need to provide tools that enable efficient collaboration while still protecting proprietary and confidential client and firm information. Dan, can you walk us through what the high-level requirements are for the professional services scenario? Yeah, absolutely. I'll, uh, I'll walk those through now. So, first of all, we have and start with offline access. The ability to get content when you're generally at a client's site, and I know how hard it is trying to get on some people's Wi-Fi's. It's more hard, kind of usually takes longer than the time that you're actually in the office. So that's a key requirement for this. The second one is collaboration, because you're often going there with a team of people to get a piece of work done. So being able to work on that, those information, whether that's 
um, you know, list items or whether that's documents is really important. The, so that's the second one. The third one, I would say, is knowledge management. And with knowledge management, the ability to kind of facilitate this knowledge sharing across these projects and teams and giving that kind of one single information repository is generally kind of key to that. That helps and leads to collaboration, which we discussed previously, but knowledge management is certainly key. The fourth one is email management. And for me, you know, this is a pretty key one and it, because a lot of information happens with clients through email, uh, through attachments, through sending of these attachments, is all really key. So people's kind of in professional work services industries sit within Outlook and that's kind of been a, a fairly key um, requirement for, for those people is to ensure that that is, is absolutely top. Um, then we go on to more of the kind of regulatory things like um, records management and being able to have those kind of the, the regulatory and organized requirements around information management policies um, associated with different content. Should you be keeping this, con this client's content for longer than it's meant to? Absolutely not. But sometimes it's really hard to do that because you have to have a mechanism in place to get rid of that content at that time. And keeping it any longer is really, really hard. And that moves on to the last one, which is e-discovery, which really is around um, ensuring that the content can be um, found and is kind of placed on litigation or hold and, and, and all of those types of things which, which are really, really important in professional services because it's all about keeping content for the right amount of time and then being able to find it if you have it. Um, so I'd say they're the, probably the, the main requirements for professional services. That's a great list, then, and I think you know many of these requirements we've talked about in other scenarios, so uh, we won't repeat those. Um, obviously, we've talked about OneDrive and using Office and Web Apps for uh, collaborating. Uh, we've talked about how those are available offline. When we get to knowledge management, one of the key pieces of knowledge management is taxonomy, and we haven't really talked about taxonomy directly, but in order to leverage taxonomy uh, and to build an information architecture, you're really talking about using SharePoint team site libraries. Uh, at this point in time, there's not really support for information architecture in the true OneDrive for Business scenario. And in fact, as Microsoft moves forward with groups, for example, and some of the new OneDrive experiences, uh, those initial versions of those experiences will not be supporting rich information architecture. Uh, there's a strong possibility, and Microsoft is listening to customers, that they might introduce some information architecture features later, uh, but for now you're pretty much talking about a SharePoint team site. And we know, and as we talked about in the information worker scenario, that um, the interaction with that taxonomy out of box is really just using the web interface uh, and using the native office applications. However, with third-party tools we saw that you could access the taxonomy and that metadata directly from Explorer. Now, you're going to be potentially spreading documents in this scenario across a variety of repositories. Some documents will be in SharePoint sites, particularly those that require taxonomy. Other documents might be in uh, your personal OneDrive for Business. Other documents might be in group repositories. And how do you then find that information? Findability is a really key question when you're talking about knowledge management. And there are several great options for uh, findability. Uh, the first of which is search, and search has been around for a long time. We all know what search is and how it works. Um, what is new are Delve and some of the newer experiences like Infopedia. Uh, Delve, which is an experience powered by Office Graph, is a way to pull together information from a variety of repositories and present it in a single, actually quite beautiful, user experience. So when I open Delve in Office 365, I'm shown documents that are likely going to be interesting to me. It's, it's, it's using business intelligence to decide what I can, what I, what I should, uh, and what I should want to see. And it's giving me information regardless of what repository that lives in. So it gives me a single unified experience with the information that I have access to. Um, the cool thing about Dell is that it lets you discover information. It lets you see what's happening without having to just poke around in every corner 
of your business and in every team that you belong to. What is the challenge with something like Delve is that it changes every time you open it because it's dynamic. It's showing you what you need to see now. What if there's information that your company wants you to see? They want to curate or manage or let's call it push or publish content to you. In that case, there are some new experiences being deployed into Office 365 that are more like traditional intranet portals. And right now, the main one that Microsoft is working on developing and will be released later this year is Codename Infopedia. And Infopedia really is that solution that's missing right now in Office 365 of being able to uh, have a managed information presentation. So pulling together information from a variety of places and the company deciding or my team deciding that this is the information I should see. So basically, I'll have three levels of findability. I'll have the information that's being shown to me with Infopedia. It's being driven to me. I'll be able to discover information with Delve. And if there's something that I am looking for that I can't find any other way, I can use search. And with those three tools and those three experiences, I think over the very near term, users will care less what container documents are stored in. They're not going to have to think, well, this is in my OneDrive for Business, and that's in my group, and this is in my team site. Those traditional container metaphors will start to become less and less important. They'll still exist on the back end. That's where we will manage the information and apply policies, etc. But users will start interacting with that information through these new experiences. What isn't going to change is people rely on email. It's amazing, isn't it? I mean, even in today's world, people just like to create an email message and attach a document to it. Uh, the good news is even that is starting to evolve. Uh, the newest versions of Outlook and Outlook Web App uh, encourage you to store documents in OneDrive rather than send it as an actual attachment. So now if I'm sending Todd and Ben a document and I click Attach in Outlook 2016, it actually suggests to me that I share it. And it puts it into OneDrive and shares the link in the email. So the email still effectively is the same as it was five years ago. It's an email message and it has an attachment except it's not really an attachment. When I click it, I'm opening up the document from OneDrive for Business, which means there's a single point of authority. We've got version control without having to name the document V1, V2, and V3. Um, and that's a nice, beautiful experience. Uh, and then the other thing that's being brought into email that's new is this entire groups experience. And now in Outlook 2016 and in the Outlook web app, you now have your groups in Outlook. So when I look at Outlook, I see my inbox, and then I see each of the groups I belong to. So if I belong to 10 teams, each team has a group, I can go in quickly and see the conversations uh, in those groups. I can access the files, the notes, and the other resources of the group directly in Outlook. Uh, and for those of you who haven't had a chance to look at Outlook 2016 yet, I highly recommend it. It's a beautiful application, and the integration with groups is something I'm really pleased with. So I've just sort of monologued a bit about the user experience. Before I turn to the, uh, uh, the enterprise's experience with this scenario, uh, uh, Ben, do you have any thoughts on, on these sort of out-of-box capabilities? In terms of encouraging people to start um, sending around the links instead of the attachments, which is effectively it is, is a great um, is a great way forward. Um, it it does require um, what I'm finding is is a bit of learning with the end users because of the way that they are presented to them and what they think they are then um, dealing with is actually an attachment that is their own version. Whereas they're actually what they don't realize is that they're editing the live version on SharePoint um, because it's fairly deceiving if you're all on a, a nice uh, modern Outlook experience. They come through and look very much like um, attachments apart from a slightly little cloud that's covered over them. So um, I think it's a great, a great what they've done. Um, I think getting getting your um, your uh, your enterprises to adopt these things is certainly on the right track, and it's just that that last hurdle, which it always is. It's the user end users just trying to battle with what what am I doing here, and and changes is is never easy for them. Absolutely, the end user adoption and training and messaging is definitely a trick. Tom, what about you? Uh, what do you think about the end user out of box experiences in this category? I think you guys pretty much summed it up here, really. Uh, there's not much to, to add to it. Uh, you guys really hit the nail on the head and all the main points that I would have brought up with regard to this as well. Cool. 
Well, then let's uh, wrap this bit, bit up with the out-of-box uh, experience as far as the enterprises uh, interests go. Ben mentioned, broadly speaking, that they're going to want to have records management applied to some categories of documents in the scenario. So if we're talking about a legal firm, for example, case documents become records. Records, of course, can't be edited and often have records management uh, policies related to retention and disposal of documents. Um, and as we've mentioned in some of the other scenarios, the only way to really support that effectively today in Office 365 and SharePoint is the SharePoint team size. Your personal OneDrive per business and the group's uh, files store do not yet have records management capabilities supporting them. And finally, there's e-discovery. And e-discovery is one of the shining successes of Office 365. By using uh, Office 365, even more than on-prem services of Exchange, SharePoint, and Skype for Business, you now have a single place at which you can focus your e-discovery activities. And Microsoft is constantly investing in and releasing new features in the e-discovery space that allow us to look for content across all of the various repositories of content in Office 365 and to put holds on that content. So I, uh, you know, my experience has been that the e-discovery capabilities of Office 365 are starting to get a lot of uh, attention from companies for whom e-discovery matters. Um, and e-discovery should matter to every company. We talked in an early, earlier scenario about sometimes the easiest way to drive investment in new technology is not to talk about ROI, uh, what's good about the technology. It's to talk about what will go wrong if you don't use the technology. And a single lawsuit for almost any company on the planet can cost more than it takes to actually implement the solution to avoid a lawsuit, which is something like e-discovery in Office 365. Um, ben, what, a, um, what have you uh, found with some of your customers in this uh, professional services space? Sure, and Microsoft is the, is the one customer here that um, is in this professional services space for us, and specifically their legal corporate affairs department. Um, they are um, like their own little legal team, kind of firm within Microsoft. Really, it's it's very clever what Nishan has, has done there, um, and they use our solution um, because they are dealing with lots of um, cases and matters. Very much, uh, if you're not familiar with the, the legal kind of terminology, um, it's very very much centered around. Um, matters and matter management, um, which is a which is a term that's popular there, which effectively is um, a, a bunch of information and, and, and documents that are about a specific thing, whether that's, so you could, it can be exactly the same if it was a project or something like that. Um, and actually they've, they found that they work constantly in, in Outlook with emails. Um, and I'm actually going to demonstrate the tool that they have here um, as helping them achieve um, SharePoint adoption within within their environment. So I'm going to quickly switch on to um, my machine here. It's just connecting up. And you'll see that I here I just have a, a quick demo machine running um, and I'm in my inbox and I only have a few email because I haven't been doing too much work. But on the left hand side, what we have is kind of where you'd usually have your data stores under under kind of your inbox. Down here we have our Cligo Engage node that sits here. And within this I have effectively the same folder structure that I had and we were looking at previously. So I was working around a project and some communications and I was showing you that I think on the on the iPad there. Whereas here I've got it represented within a structure of Outlook. And if I start clicking on these nodes, what it's actually doing is it's presenting that content to me where, as if it's Outlook content. You might be familiar with old, kind of the old public folders, and, and this is very much that kind of similar concept, the similar user experience. I can click on these items, and I can get previews and generate previews on the right-hand side um, as I'm getting these, this content down from SharePoint. So a really nice way to navigate for end users um, and see that interaction. More importantly, a lot of information goes back and forth in emails. Especially at Microsoft, they're sending out lots of agreements, getting signed copies back. They're working on litigation cases around those agreements. Um, so what they love to do is take the attachment out, move it to a location within the uh, repository. So I can dump it into my archive here and let go of that 
and I have a nice metadata prompt that I wouldn't expect um, because this is not an Outlook metadata prompt. This is actually our product that's kicked in here. It's automatically discovered where I've dropped the content, so it's populated some of the content here. It's decided to give it a unique, unique name, and I can click OK, and that item is going to be uploaded the next time I have connection. And if I have connection, it'll happen pretty quickly. So a really nice way to integrate into the Outlook experience, um, whether that's uh, kind of from the sending, the, the receiving of email. I can also do it from a, the sending as well. So being able to send and file emails straight away right from here within the new email. Um, a nice tight integration so that users don't, don't have to kind of know that they're using SharePoint too much um, is our kind of experience of what our customers want. Um, once the items are up there, I can come into the pull in a search pane here and enter some criteria that is going to go off and search my SharePoint site. So right, actually I'll search for something that's fairly common in my test site. Uh, this is actually sending off a, a quick search query term to SharePoint to pull back the latest results. Um, and they're going to start displaying here once uh, once I pick up the connection. Uh, the the results of that search query is going to allow me to do things like um, obviously open them up and edit the content right here. Um, but it's also going to allow me to do things like send them as attachments, um, interact with them as you would do at any item that you that you find on on the uh, on a SharePoint site. So they're the things that are uh, are kind of. Microsoft specifically used this product for. Um, I think the key ones, just to recap, are the ability to take content out of the inbox into SharePoint and capture that metadata at that time. So get that metadata captured and um, straight away, not have to worry about going back to the SharePoint site to capture the metadata. Um, the, the kind of second one is the really nice preview ability that Outlook has that we've managed to utilize with SharePoint so I can navigate my SharePoint repositories and preview that content. And then the third one is the findability and, and that we mentioned and being able to search and pull back content that I have sitting on SharePoint here and be able to then interact with that content. So by right clicking I can do various things that I would expect to do. So I think that covers off the main kind of key uh, pro kind of flows that users work with here. Um, obviously I can do multiple attachments, multiple emails all at once and the nice tagging kind of um, capabilities all built in there. Uh, ben, that's super, super, super cool and it's awesome that Microsoft itself is a customer of a third-party tool for yeah. uh, helping support their mobility for their professional services. Um, and if you're going to build something, if you're going to develop something in this space, uh, particularly something that integrates with email, there are some very exciting new uh, interfaces and, and models with which to do that. In fact, Microsoft Legal has built uh, an alternative way of integrating with SharePoint by creating an Office add-in that actually allows a user, when they receive an email with a document, to uh, uh, open up an app uh, that then gives them immediate ability to file that document in a specific manner. So this is a, a very specifically built custom scenario for one solution that allows them to um, uh, uh, take a document and put it into a legal matter uh, as opposed to a third-party solution that might give you a, a solution across multiple different types of scenarios. Um, and Todd, what is your experience with uh, some of these new ways of integrating, uh, particularly the email scenario that professional services people tend to be um, heavy in? What, what are some cool ways uh, of supporting that? Well, actually, I haven't implemented any projects that actually do the email integration and things like this uh, with regard to what Ben demonstrated there. But I have used these products before, and I think it's absolutely fantastic that I can take a document, put it into my um, uh, SharePoint site, and then immediately just send someone a link to that to keep it out of all of our inbox. And that just saves me a whole lot of time to be able to do that. Some of the email integration um, you saw was uh, previously in the other scenario when we demonstrated how you can pull emails and the group conversations from the unified groups uh, via an API and bake them into another user interface like we did with the Contosil property management piece. So that really helps make a more integrated experience if you want to work with email messaging outside of the Outlook client.
Over the course of this series, we've looked at four very typical business scenarios that require uh, mobility. We've looked at the standard information worker, which today is a mobile worker. We've looked at field sales executives, field technicians and engineers, and professional services organizations like law firms, legal and finance firms. Let's take those requirements that we've been uh, introducing in each of those scenarios and bring them together into a single requirements checklist that you can use to evaluate any mobile scenario that faces your business. And we'll group those requirements into a couple of categories. First, you need to think about mobility itself. Where and when is the content needed? Is it needed across multiple devices? Where is it going to be needed? And what kinds of locations? Do those locations uh, have low speed or latency problems? Do those locations uh, have access at all? Or do you need offline access to the content? And what is your requirement for security? So you can take any business scenario and look at those dimensions and decide what are the actual mobility requirements for that scenario. Then, based on uh, from there, you can look at what the user experience needs to be. How easy or discoverable does the experience need to be for your users? How native does it need to feel? In other words, is it okay that a user launches something on an iPad that doesn't look at all like an iPad experience, or does it need to feel like a bad native iPad experience? And then focus obviously on content requirements. What do the users need to have access to for your mobile scenario? We've talked about documents, contacts, calendars, tasks, lists, forms, media, business data, business intelligence that makes sense of that data, and conversations with peers and with customers. And you, and after identifying what types of content users require in a particular scenario, look at the enterprise content requirements around that content. Does there need to be information architecture? What are the taxonomy uh, requirements, for example? And how are you going to make that content findable in that specific scenario? Once you've identified those sets of requirements, you can then look at how you're going to drive adoption of the solution. And one of the key questions that my customers often fail to ask themselves early enough is how are you going to actually measure adoption? How are you going to know that people are using the solution you've built and not going around IT and creating rogue solutions on unsanctioned platforms? And last but not least, how are you going to govern the solution as a whole? How are you going to manage access? Permissions, for example. Are you going to need to apply rights management, information rights management? Are you going to need to preserve content as records? What kind of auditing and insight do you need and report it? And if you ever get a, a, a legal action that, that, that surrounds this particular use case, are you going to need to support that legal action with e-discovery? And last but not least, how are you going to support the solution as a whole and end users? Supportability is a real key question that I think customers, again, don't pay enough attention to up front. If you're going to deploy a mobile solution, what happens if something goes wrong? If something goes wrong with Office 365, Office 365, Microsoft has support for that, but is it really the support you need? Does it, is it as responsive and as detailed as what you need? If you're going to turn to a third party, what is their record of support? How confident are you that they're going to be able to help you solve problems when there's a business critical scenario that's going wrong? Um, and if you build a solution, one of the key risks you take in building a solution is when the developer or developer that build that solution move on, and something needs to be modified or supported in that solution, how can that be done? So if you take this requirements checklist and put it against any business scenario, you'll be able to understand that scenario's mobility requirements. If we take those requirements and split them into two axes, we can create what we'll call the configure, build, or buy matrix. Because in the end, for any mobile scenario, you need to decide is it something you can configure with out-of-box SharePoint and Office 365? Is it something you are going to need to build as a custom solution? Or is it something that you really might need a third-party tool to buy to support that solution? And the way I recommend you create this matrix is put the content types that are involved with the solution down one axis, axis and put the various mobility and governance requirements across the other axis. And in each cell, in each intersection between a column and a row, you're going to make a decision about whether you can configure that specific cell, whether you can build it or whether you can buy it. So for example, if we were to take the very first content requirement, your mobile scenario requires documents. 
and one of your requirements is offline access. The intersection of that is offline access for documents. And in that case, you can probably configure that with OneDrive for Business. But then if you add security into that mix, the security requirement and documents starts to be a problem on mobile devices when uh, the OneDrive app allows you to take any document from your OneDrive and share it even into unsanctioned services. So in that case, you can't necessarily configure security for documents offline in uh, the OneDrive application. You might need to use a third-party solution to buy a solution to support that requirement. So now you've got two different uh, requirements that have two different possible solutions. You can configure the offline access, but if you really need to support the security, you would need to buy a solution for that. So now how do you make a decision between the two? In each cell, you need to look at the importance of that requirement and the cost of building or buying and the risk of not building or buying. Now the algorithm you use to decide importance, cost, and risk is really going to be dependent on the scenario and what your business is doing. But if you then fill in this matrix and in each cell you look at can it be configured, build, or bought, and if it needs to be built or bought, what's the important cost and risk? You can then take the entire matrix and decide for this mobile solution as a whole, am I going to be able to meet my needs enough without a box? Do I really need a third-party solution to get me 80 or 90 or 100 percent of the way? Or do I need to invest in building a solution that takes me 100 percent of the way um, but introduces its own risks? So hopefully this is an approach to evaluating mobile scenarios that will help you um, uh, it, it make very intelligent and informed and comprehensive decisions. So let's wrap this up with some words of wisdom from our experts, uh, from our guests, Todd and Ben. Why don't you fill us in on and put, put a ribbon around this and help us understand what we need to take away about planning for SharePoint success and supporting mobility. Okay, I'll jump in first, Dan. Uh, I think that the main points we have here of understand what SharePoint Office 365 offers and configure, buy, or build, those really go back to what you just talked about in the matrix there. That's step one. You really have to know what's available, what's on the menu, how do you use it, how does it fit in your organization, and then make a decision accordingly. Interesting that we also chose the word align here, right? You're aligning business requirements to the capabilities of the services. Why are we saying that? Usually you are aligning technologies to the requirements of the business. But the reason we're saying that is because so many of these technologies are brand new. And they're ever evolving in Office 365. So if you try to always make your business requirement exactly this process, it has to be this way, you may find sometimes that you don't have the budget to implement it exactly as you want if you need to build that or buy something custom as opposed to configuring it. So you need to be a little bit flexible with this as these technologies evolve right now because really we're in the infancy of Office 365 as well as mobile technologies. Even though they've been around for a couple years, right, this stuff is very new. So you need to make sure that you can be flexible enough to not always say, I can't use this, or I have to build this. See if you can think a little bit outside of the box as you plan your technologies and uh, pick what you want to use. I think I would kind of add to that. Um, the two main areas for me to focus on would be that initial understand area. Um, once you understand all of this, and I would go even a little bit further. We saw the matrix there that we had um, around cost and risk and working out kind of whether or kind of putting an algorithm in there. I would keep, I would try as much as you can to keep that as a value of money. So keep that as a dollar value. Put a risk in terms of a number, a kind of go out there and put a number up there that the risk if we don't do this is a million dollars and say that. And one thing that I've learned in my time is that what, that what that isn't is correct, because you'll never get that correct. But what it does do is it starts the talking, the talking point between the group of people that are going to decide whether or not that's important. And that feeds the importance. So if you have a cost associated with, with it, which is a dollar amount, a risk associated with it that's a dollar amount, those two things, as part of your business, they're probably driving your business. So that 
number will equate to how important that actual item is. So you can almost judge the importance based on those two numbers together. And they won't be right. They are never right. But what it does is it gets the, the people that you're trying to um, influence on the same page. What you can then also do is measure it afterwards. So we'll jump right to the last one, which is measuring success. You want to know that you've done a good job, that you kicked ass. You, we want to, you know, we want you to know that. So what we what we do is we effectively try and prove the success of the tools and the what you've implemented. And I think that's really important: is defining what success looks like at the beginning, measuring what success is at the end, and they're kind of the the two key things that I think I would highlight here. And if we go on to the next slide, the, the kind of penultimate slide. We're going to move into the next steps of this webinar. And really, from, from a Caligo's perspective, we've got a couple of useful tools out there. We have a, a white paper on the five pitfalls to mobilize SharePoint. And also, we have an evaluator's checklist. So you can go through, and, and if you are looking to kind of look into a third-party solution, then an, an evaluator's checklist is exactly what you should be using to, to walk you through that. Um, and obviously, finally, we've got free trials available of all of our tools today. Um, and you don't need to be using the latest and greatest. We've talked a lot here about Office 365. The reality is that not everyone's pushing the boundaries there. Um, all of our tools go back and support um, as early as SharePoint 2007. Um, so download the tools, give them a try with your tools, and, and get mobilized today. And some resources that we have to share from Canvas. Uh, obviously, uh, one, one of the things I talked about is we do a lot of custom development. So if you're interested in the build scenario, that's something we can help you out with. And you can learn more about all the different capabilities we do with mobile, both with and without Office 365 and SharePoint. A great example, if you're looking to arm your developers with information they need to build these types of solutions, particularly that Contoso property management code sample I demoed. You can find that at the link on this site here. It has full source code. You can install it right on your Office 365 tenancy. You can watch a full video of the entire scenario front to back there and really learn all about how you can use these technologies to build something custom. If you're learning in particular how to build iOS, Android, or Cordova apps as well, I have a link to a session that I mentioned before that Josh and I presented at Build. And Josh Gavon and I here walk you through starting bare bones with iOS, Android, and Cordova, authenticating to Office 365, and then calling a variety of Office 365 services uh, to make those things straight into mobile applications you would build. One other thing that we talked about before was many times you are limited in what you can do from a user customization point of view to adapt Office 365 SharePoint sites so that they work well within mobile devices. Uh, one thing that we have available that you can get a free trial to as well is our product called OneNav. And OneNav is pretty much a replacement for the out-of-the-box SharePoint navigation menu. And it brings back the old breadcrumb from old SharePoint. And it's fully supported that you can tailor that UI to look however you want so it works perfectly in desktop web browsers, tablets, and in other mobile devices such as phones. Awesome. And, you know, at the beginning of this journey, we talked about the fact that mobility is a complex scenario, and already 11% of organizations, according to the AIM study, are using third-party tools to support uh, mobility, and a whole one-third of them are looking at uh, moving to third-party tools to support it. And I just want to emphasize from a sort of uh, analyst perspective, that, it, 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 that you, sh you should definitely include examination of third-party tools and examination of the build option whenever you've got a business scenario that requires mobility that is either of high value or high risk to your organization. You need these resources. So reach out to these third-party product companies and these third-party service companies to help achieve your mobile goals. Um, and do come back to IT Unity as well. Uh, you will find at IT Unity we've got uh, great articles on mobility uh, from myself, from Tom Gitsky, and many other uh, MVPs and experts. 
We will be doing more webinars and web shows on Unity Vision, where you've accessed this event. Uh, and if you want to stay up to date with all the very rapidly changing environments in Office 365 and SharePoint, we've got a great set of newsletters that can bring the, the curated news from the experts to your inbox. And we've got a series of web shows on Unity Vision that will keep you up to date. And last but not least, meet us. Come to our events and say hello to all of us. Todd, as well as Caligo, are going to be online and in person at our Unity Connect events. And you can learn more about those at unityconnect.com. So on behalf of IT Unity, Todd, Ben, I'd like to say thank you guys so much for joining us. It's been a real pleasure to spend some time talking with you about mobility. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Ted. Glad to be here. And now we will uh, open up to live Q&A. So if you've got questions, we've got answers, hopefully. Uh, and you've been submitting questions along the way in the text-based chat. We'll now address those questions. If you have any additional questions, feel free to submit those. And we will take a moment to turn on our microphones and answer those questions for you. 